1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse number 13, reading through verse number 21. And the King James text today reads, Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of God, excuse me, the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love Him because He first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment this afternoon. Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace. As the word of God declares, it's our privilege as children of the Most High. Oh God, today how we need a word from heaven. So many in the church have been pushed away by believers who are overcome with political ambitions and with ambitions to affect change and control in the world in which we live. Father, today so many in the church are not living what you would have us to live and we need instruction we need instruction in righteousness we need truth oh God not dogma not that which stirs up emotion but rather oh God that which stirs up a desire within us to live right and to do right and to represent you and the gospel for which you died in a manner that it deserves to be represented. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost today, oh God. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If I'm to deliver this message in a manner, oh God, that will bring fruit unto righteousness in the ear and in the life of every hearer. Anoint today as well, dear Lord, our audience, those today who have joined us by reason of the internet, those who will watch this message later, let the anointing of God flow like a mighty river, affect change, better us, elevate us, help us to be better after than we were before. We ask it all in that mighty saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You'll notice today that the 
visual I've chosen as an aid in helping you to kind of understand the title of my message a little bit. Why do you act like that? That's my question today. Why do you act like that? Tom Cruise, the world-renowned actor, gained all kinds of attention when he jumped all over Oprah Winfrey's television studio set, finally to leap up on the sofa declaring, I'm in love. We often see people behaving in ways that we've never before seen them behave, only to find out that they're doing so, as in Tom Cruise's instance, because they're in love. You ever seen somebody, you got a friend, you got a family member, you know, and all of a sudden they're acting so different, they're not... They're not being the way they've always been and things are changed in the way they conduct themselves. And you think to yourself, why in the world is he acting like that? I'm, I'm used to him being so much more this way or so much more that way. Maybe there's somebody who used to drink quite a bit, you know, and they were the quote-unquote life of the party. All of a sudden they show up at a family gathering and they're just being all sedate and calm and they're not acting the fool and they're not putting lampshades on their head, you know, and they're sober as a judge and you smell around them, you don't smell the smell of alcohol and you wonder what in the world's going on. Then all of a sudden this pretty girl comes walking through the door. And he smiles real big and he goes over and takes her hand. Oh, he got a new girlfriend. You know what? She probably don't like drinking. You know what? She probably don't like drunkenness. Hello now, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, things have changed. Things have changed. Why did they change? Well, apparently somebody in love. Amen. Somebody's enamored with somebody else. And that affects change in us. When we fall in love, that affects change in us, does it not? Amen. And then the more we spend time with that person who is our love interest, the more changes that occur. And it's not that we change to become more appealing to that individual because Obviously, they're already attracted to us already. They already like us. We don't have to win them over in that regard. But there are things that please them more. There are things that make them happy that aren't normally part of our routine. Years ago, Tommy's going to kill me when I say this because unfortunately I'm, I'm not able to do it anymore but years ago I was in a long-term relationship and I was working and I get paid in every payday I made a habit now I'm not a well-to-do man never have been probably never will be but I made a habit of going to the local store I was living in New York City and they have these little flower shops and stuff along the street Every payday I made a habit of buying a little bunch of flowers and bringing them home, dead flowers with weeds in them. <laughs> I was trying to get that look off Tommy's face. <laughs> Not dead flowers, but you know, a little package of flowers. They only cost about maybe ten bucks or so at the time, five or ten bucks. And I'd bring them home to my then partner. And I didn't do that to win their, his affection. I already had it. I didn't do it to win anything. I did it because it made him happy. And part of my job, part of being in a relationship is striving to make the other half happy. That, that's what we want to do. If you're going to be the other half of my whole then I sure enough want you to be a happy half, amen? Because a happy half makes for a happier whole. Do you follow? W-H-O-L-E. A happy half makes for a happier whole. So we're going to be getting happier together if you're happy on your side. Do you follow what I'm saying? And if both members, both parties in a couple 
treat one another well and do what makes the other one happy, guess what? You got a happy union. You've got a happy marriage. Why? Because you both are working toward making the other happy. Amen. So Tom Cruise got up and jumped around like a monkey in a cage at the zoo and I'll never forget it. It was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen. Then he leaped up on the sofa as you see pictured today and my visual aid and uh, you know and declares I'm in love and it was Katie Holmes. who Holmes. Katie Holmes that he was declaring his love for they're not together anymore sadly enough but he made quite the fool of himself and you might ask him why do you act like that his answer God only knows what it would be but you know, there's also reasons that I'm sure he wouldn't point to. He may act like that because it's the first time in his life he ever got from somebody what Katie Holmes gave to him. And yet if you asked him, why do you act like that? He wouldn't even say that because he didn't realize that. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? It's a psychological factor that goes deeper. He would say simply, oh, because this beautiful girl or at least in his estimation. This beautiful girl is crazy about me and blah, blah, blah. That, that is why I'm jumping around. But then there are other psychological reasons that go deeper than that that I'm sure also played into this issue. When you love someone, especially someone who possesses attributes that you admire, if not even envy, you find yourself emulating them and doing everything in your power to be more like them. I don't know about you, but I tend to be attracted to people who are very much the opposite of me. I can be, at times, Tommy, leave the room. <laughs> I can be at times a little reactionary. I can get a little emotional at times. I'm not talking about Nathan Lane in the birdcage emotional, you know. <laughs> falling out over toast that's too hard or something. But I mean, you know, I, 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 I come from an anxious family. I really do. And, and I, I come by this honestly. And I can be something at times of a worry war. And it drives me insane because I'm a man of faith. I believe in God. I trust the Lord. And I really do all that. But I struggle at times with becoming anxious and, you know, uh, not having the patience that I ought to have. And I'm too smart to pray for patience. Because the Word of God said that uh, tribulation bringeth patience. So I'd rather avoid that. Amen. I pray for wisdom. I pray for knowledge and understanding. I pray for all the goodies that don't come with a box of hand grenades with the pins all pulled. Amen. But patience is just, that's one bomb I'd rather not unlock. Well, Tommy tends to be more of the calm, cool, collected type, you know. Just kind of sliding on through. Sometimes it drives me crazy, but honestly, deep in my heart, I admire it and I appreciate it. And I can be a boisterous person. I can be a very gregarious person, outgoing person. I have no problem, and folks, I'm going to tell you a little secret. This is God, because this is not the way I was as a young person. But I can stop at a restaurant at any table and talk to folks, and you know. And if I was going to be a minister of the gospel, that was one talent I had to have. Well, guess what? When I was very young, I was extremely shy and pretty introverted. The only person I talked a whole lot to was my mother, and she could tell you I drove her out of her mind because she was the only person on the planet I really talked to, you know. So when I got around her, man, I talked her brains out. But otherwise, I was very quiet. I stayed to myself. I didn't talk to a whole lot of people. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. But as I grew older, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, the 
if I'm going to be a preacher and a pastor, I'm going to have to have some better skills on the social set. So you need to help me. And when he filled me with the Holy Ghost, one of the byproducts of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is boldness. And I became very bold. All of a sudden, I didn't have a problem talking to people. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Deep down inside me, believe it or not, there is still this little vein of apprehension. And, and people see me do it and they just assume, oh, he does that so easily. No, I don't. Believe it or not, there's still a little part of my flesh that pulls against my spirit. It says, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to. But I need to. If I'm going to be a witness and a testimony, if I'm going to be effective, then I have to be able to be outgoing and precarious. Well, Tommy was not when I met him. No, he pretty much stuck to his little close group of friends. And that was the only people he really talked a whole lot to. We'd go into store, we'd go into restaurant, and I'd stop and talk to him, and he'd sit there and look at me like I was nuts. Like there was something wrong with my head. That I would just stop and talk to a child or talk to an adult that I never met and I never knew before. And he just thought I was crazy. Well, you know, when you love somebody, I'm going to tell you, children, if, if you're a young person today, even if you're an older person, you need to understand this today. You ought to fall in love with somebody that has attributes that you admire. Because down the road a ways, you're going to find yourself striving to kind of adopt those admirable traits for yourself. You're going to try to borrow those from your partner. If you don't fall for somebody you admire, you know, it's one thing to think they're cute or they're hot. But it's another thing to admire, whether it be their business acumen, you know, their social skills, whatever the case might be. But if you don't fall in, some, in love with somebody that you admire, that there are things about them you really appreciate and admire, then uh, there is nothing in them that will cause you to aspire to be more than you already are. You've seen in the movies, on television, probably read in books, where somebody will say to their love interest, you make me want to be a better person. You ever seen that portrayed? Now let me ask you a question. Tommy, you don't have to shake your head or anything. I don't want to know. But when you look at your partner, when you look at your love interest, can you honestly say, you make me want to be a better person. See, I can say that. I look at Tommy and he, and I can honestly say, you make me want to be a better person. I've dated people in the past that they did not make me want to be a better person. I could kind of go along with them and just be me, so to speak. And even areas in my own life that I wasn't crazy about, I wasn't wild about, I felt no, you know, desire to work on them or change them. Why? Because this person is such that I just don't see the need. I don't feel motivated to do that. But when you really fall in love with somebody that you admire and you appreciate things about them, it makes you want to be a better person. I remember years ago singing in the old holiness church a chorus that goes something like this. The reason I'm living this life is I don't want to be lost. The reason I'm living this life is I don't want to be lost. The reason I'm living this life is I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be lost when Jesus comes. The reason I'm living this life, the reason I act like I do is because I don't want to be lost. That's what the song says. We're celebrating fear. They're 
actually singing songs in the church that celebrate fear. But what did our primary text tell us today? Our primary text today said in verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. I'm not living my life today as a child of God. I don't act the way I act today as a child of God because I'm afraid of hell. I do so because I love the Lord. Amen. There is a marked difference between motivations. Somebody who lives for God, someone who lives the Christian life because they're afraid to go to hell is not on the same level as somebody who lives for God and lives the Christian life because they love God the Lord. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Honey, I guarantee you you're going to have very different spirits, very different attitudes in those two people because one of them is living based on fear. The other is living without fear. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you when you live your Christian life without fear here, it is a much more wonderful journey than living your Christian life full of fear, constantly dreading, I may fall, I may falter, I may find my way out of grace, and ultimately I may be lost. Oh, child of God today, you need to understand that our walk with God ought not to be a walk that is paved with fear, but rather a walk that is paved in love. Oh, I want to tell you, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and that love motivates me today to be more like Him, and to do things which please Him, and to avoid those things which disappoint Him. Amen. The Word of God declares in Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, listen, who loved me and gave Himself for me. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, our primary text today, John the writer declares, We love Him because He first loved us. Oh, I want to tell you, I live the way I live, I do the way I do, I act the way I act because I'm in love. Hallelujah. Yeah. Not because I'm afraid, but because I'm in love. Glory to God. And I'm in love with somebody who makes me want to be a better person. I'm in love with somebody who makes me want to kind of emulate them more. There are things about Jesus that I would love to have in my life. You know, I'm going to tell you, when, when you get around some good old-fashioned Pentecostal people who are living for God the way that you ought to live for God, and I again, I, I give honor today to some of the glorious saints that I've grown up with uh, throughout the course of my life, the church I grew up in. You know, you had Brother Cecil Obar. You had Sister McLean. You had some incredible, marvelous Christian people that, oh, Tommy, I, even as a kid, I used to look at them and just kind of my jaw would drop because they were so calm in spirit and they were so controlled and they were so uh, meek and, and uh, gentle and they were very, uh, what's the word I want to find here? Uh, you know, they, they just had such a Christ-like spirit about them. You had to admire it. You just had to. Then I think later in life, you go to the Riverside Church of God. I'm going to tell you, when I got to the Riverside Church of God, I couldn't believe the people, the spirit there, uh, the difference between the assemblies of God I grew up in and the church of God I, I wound up in. Uh, 
the Assemblies of God always kind of followed that uh, fundamentalist mindset where the politics was a lot of the message, you know. And and I, I'm not belittling my upbringing in the Assemblies. I got a lot of good stuff out of that, a lot of good stuff. And I love and appreciate every single pastor I ever had to this day. To this day. When I went to the Church of God, they, at the time anyway, they did not include politics in their message. At least Brother Gillum did, and I'll tell you. His message was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His message was love God, give God everything you've got. If you're going to live for the Lord, live for Him, you know, 100%, not 20% or 30 And But there was such a love in those people, and there was such, uh, I, I, I just never saw quite like I did at Riverside. And there were saints there that you just had to admire. Brother and sister Dewey King. Oh my goodness. Those people bring tears to your eyes watching them live their lives. They were the most amazing Christian people I've ever seen. I swear to God, right hand in the air, I was going to put my left hand up, but right hand in the air, I swear to God those people could not go swimming because they wouldn't be able to sink down in the water. They would just walk on water. They were they were the most incredible, godly, loving. I don't care. You could be the biggest so-called sinner on the planet. You could be the most flamboyant, flaming homosexual that ever walked the earth. And on top of that, be a, a blazing fool of a drunk. And you know, and brother and sister came, I believe with every ounce of my being, would love you to death. You would not get one crossword out of them. You would not hear one word of judgment out of them. You would not hear anything nasty. Same thing with Brother and Sister Gillum. Brother and Sister Gillum had a reputation all over the community of being the most loving people. Everybody I ever did business with, and I mentioned I went to the Riverside Church of God, immediately the response I got was, oh, that's Brother Gillum's church. Oh, he and his wife are the most loving people. Isn't it wonderful to have that reputation? I wish I could have that reputation. Unfortunately, I'm not Brother Gillum. I'm not Brother King. We all come into this walk with our own baggage. We all come in with our own background. We all come in with our own upbringing. There are things about each and every one of us that as much as we'd like to change it, it may never change. Because it's just there permanently and that's what it's going to be. But Jesus makes me want to be a better person. And because He makes me want to be a better person, it causes me as well to love the other saints in the church. And I love good people. I love godly people. The more someone emulates Christ, the more I'm crazy about them. Do you follow what I'm saying now? Amen. I see my brothers and sisters in Christ who really live like Jesus, who really walk like the Lord. And boy, I'm going to tell you, I just love them to death. Amen. It's like you know people and you love their parents. Their parents are the sweetest people, the nicest people. And then you meet their kid and the kid acts just like mom and dad. And you just are crazy about the kid. Why? Well, the kid acts just like mom and dad. Why wouldn't he? He was raised by them, right? My cousin Johnny by marriage, Jennifer married Johnny because Johnny was just like his dad and mom. He had that same, and to this day he does. Johnny, I love Johnny. Johnny's got a marvelous spirit. Very loving, very kind, very compassionate. Oh, other believers who like, live right encourage me to be more like Jesus. They inspire me to step up higher, amen? That's one reason why we ought to love the brethren and appreciate the brethren. Because somewhere in there, there are things that they're capable of. There are things that they do that ought to inspire us and encourage us to step up higher. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 4-6, through 6, the Word of God declares, He that saith, I know him, 
and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. What does that mean? We say we love the Lord. Then we ought to emulate the Lord. Amen. We say we love the Lord. Then we ought to do things the way the Lord has asked us, instructed us to do them. Amen. If I'm married to somebody and they say, you know, when you set the table, I like the napkin to be folded just a certain way and placed in the center of the plate. Now, I'm used to putting the napkin under the fork and the knife and the spoon on the right side of the plate, you know, like an old country bumpkin. Oh, but they like to add a little flair, you know. They want that napkin folded just a certain way, put it in the center of the plate. Now, are we going to wind up divorced? If I don't fold that napkin just that way and put it in the center, probably not. But you know what? That little thing makes my partner happy, makes my spouse happy. And because that little thing makes my spouse happy, I do it. I made a vow when my great-grandmother died. There is no human being on this planet that I can honestly say I've loved more or thought more of than my great-grandmother on my mother's side, my mother's mother's mother. I lived to 30 years of age and my great-grandmother was still in my life. Most people don't have that blessing, amen. You know, most people, if they're blessed, they might have their grandparents for a large portion of their life. But my great-grandmother, my great-grandmother, two, three generations removed from me, was one of the most godly, sweetest, loving, caring, compassionate women I ever knew. When I came out in 1989, my great-grandmother never said a crossword to me. She never flinched. She never batted an eyelash. She, there was nothing about her that changed in her conduct toward me. I can say the same thing was true of my grandfather on my mother's side, which I appreciate as well. But my great-grandmother was just the most amazing, Holy Ghost-filled, spiritual, godly, living women I've ever known in my life. When my great-grandmother died, I was devastated. I, I never experienced a death the way I did when Grandma died. It was horrible. I, I've never felt like that in my life, and I hope and pray to God I never have to again. I literally, at the coffin at the end of the service, broke down and reached out and touched the box. I've never done anything like this. I was a pallbearer. But there the casket lay on the straps over the open grave, and I reached out and I touched the box, and I said, Grandma, this is the closest I'll ever be to you until Jesus comes. And all of a sudden the dam broke and I began to weep and cry and I was inconsolable. I wept so hard you could hear me across the cemetery grounds. And cousins began to come over and put their arms around me and give me hugs. And my uncle Philip, bless his heart, tried to console me. I could not be consoled. I was sobbing. Oh my God, the pain inside of me was so great I couldn't stand it. My grandmother, my great-grandmother inspired me every day of my life to be a better person and to be a better Christian. Everything about her just made you want to live for God better. My great-grandma, I remember watching her as a child in the church. I remember her being slain in the Holy Ghost and laying on that floor for hours. And then coming up from that floor, and boy, I mean, 
she could have walked home and never touched the ground. It seemed like her feet were off the ground. It seemed like she was just floating on cloud nine. I saw my great grandmother, for those of you that are not Pentecostal, you may not understand this language, but I saw my great grandmother so full of the Holy Ghost and so uh, 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 overtaken by the power of God that she was what we refer to as drunk in the spirit. I mean, bomb. And it wasn't with wine or alcohol or whiskey. It was with the power of God. And honey, she didn't even know who you were. Grandma, I'm your grandkid. Are you? Oh. <laughs> she was so full of the Holy Ghost, she couldn't see straight. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Men and brethren, these are not drunken with wine as ye suppose. Apparently on the day of Pentecost, somebody was acting drunk. Because that's the word Peter was hearing in his ear. That people were thinking these people were drunk. When the power of God gets on you and in you to such a degree that it's overflowing and it's in abundance. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You literally become drunk in the spirit. I've seen it happen many, many times. I saw my grandmother before I was born, I guess, my Mothers told the story about how my grandmother was slain in the Holy Ghost for a while. That means she just fell to the floor as though she were dead, like the prophet in the Old Testament when he stood before the Lord. The Bible said he fell to the ground as, the, as dead. Sometimes the presence of God... See, I'm telling you folks, when I tell you I believe God's real, this is why I dress right when I go to church, because God's real to me. He's as, as sure to be there as I am. I saw my little grandmother fall backward in the church one time, and I literally saw her feet come off the ground. No kidding. I saw this with my own eyes. And then I saw her literally glide down like a feather to the ground. That scientifically is impossible. I don't know how in the world that, that could happen except it be God. One time after being slain in the spirit, my great-grandmother came too. And for hours, all she could say were the words, He was beautiful. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. She had seen the Lord in a vision during that time. And all she could say of Him was, He was beautiful. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. My great-grandmother was somebody that every person that ever met her, I promise you, fell in love with her. I've taken Tommy to visit members of my family who were either on my father's side of the family or they were on my mother's side, but they were on her father's side. So they were not by blood. Uh, connected to my grandmother, my great grandmother. But you mentioned her name, and all of a sudden it was, oh, that Mary, oh, she was such a saint. What a wonderful lady. Am I telling the truth, Tommy? Everybody ever knew her. All they ever did was sing her praises. All they ever did was talk about how wonderful a child of God she was, and how sweet she was, and how loving she was. I have cousins that are not related to, by blood to my great-grandmother, but they had the opportunity in this life to get to know her a little bit. And <clears throat> they would tell me, oh, Grandma Mary was the most amazing person. Just, just sing her praises. Folks, I want to tell you today, I used to bring, I lived in New York City and I would take the train into Connecticut to visit my family and I'd buy a bag of uh, hard candies while I was in, you know, like Brock's hard candies individually wrapped and I'd buy them in New York City at a CBS and I'd bring them to Connecticut because I knew my grandmother loved those candies. My great grandma loved those hard candies. I'd get to my grandparents' home. She lived with her daughter and son-in-law, my grandmother and grandfather on my mom's side. And I'd say, Grandma, here, I brought you some hard candy. My grandmother, to act like I just gave her a bag of gold, 
oh my goodness. She'd say, oh, well, thank you, Chucky. Oh, that's so sweet of you. You were thinking of me. I appreciate that. And boy, she'd go in the kitchen and, Don, looky there, Chucky brought me some hard candies. And, and I don't want to make her sound retarded because she was anything but. But I mean, she just, she'd tell my grandmother, look here, Chucky brought me some heart all the way from New York he carried them all she appreciated every little thing you ever did for her I got news for you today so does Jesus not only does God prefer we do things a certain way ask us to do things a certain way but he is so grateful and appreciative when we do you see that's one thing you don't hear preached in many churches am I telling the truth Nobody tells you that God is grateful for our right conduct. He's grateful when we live right and we act right. And when we're trying to be a witness and a testimony to the lost in the midst of a dying world. In Matthew 22 verses 26, excuse me, 36. Get the glasses on preacher. Through verse 38. Master, he is asked, which is the great commandment of, in the law? In other words, which is the premier, most important commandment contained within the law? Verse 37, Matthew 22. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This, is the first and great commandment. Isn't it funny that the first and great commandment is thou shalt not? Isn't it interesting that the most important commandment according to the Lord Jesus Christ has nothing to do with what you do or how you do it, but rather it is a call to the people of God to love Him. Well, wait a minute. If you're calling me to love you, then you're not asking me, listen, you're not asking me to be afraid of you. Am I telling the truth? Amen. He didn't say, you better be afraid of me because you're going to hell if you don't do right. No. The first commandment is, love the Lord your God. Well, why in the world would God first tell us to love Him and encourage us to love Him. And not just to love Him uh, from the heart, not just to love Him in this little pocket of our emotion or in this little pocket of our mind or in this little pocket of our spirit, but with all your heart, with all your mind. Why would God ask us to do that? I'll tell you why. Because the more you love Him, the more you will emulate Him. See, the Lord knew if you got this one down, then the rest of the commandments would all fall into line. You wouldn't even have to be asked not to murder. You wouldn't even have to be asked not to lie. You wouldn't even have to be asked not to commit adultery. You wouldn't even have to be, am I to, do you understand what I'm saying? Asked not to envy. Amen. No, when you love the Lord, first and foremost, and the more you love Him, the more you want to be like why do you act like that? Because I'm in love. The Lord compels us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and strength, our mind, our soul. The way to grow in love with the Lord is to, to grow in the knowledge of Him. As the more you know Him, the more you will love Him. As the old Church of God song used to say, the more I know Him, the more I love Him. Hallelujah. He takes my heartache and my burdens, and He gives my face a glow. And with each new day, God finds a new way to make me happy. That's why I love Him so. Oh, my Lord. You cannot love God and not love your brother whom you have seen. When we love God, we love all those who also embrace and love Him. Amen. Scripture declares we know we love God when we love His people. And the commandments of God are not grievous. If you can't do the things 
which someone asks you to do, then you must not be as much in love with them as you might have thought. I'm going to tell you something. When an abusive man gets in a relationship with a woman or another human being, and they're abusive to that person, and they don't do the things that please that other person, and they don't do the things that make that other person happy. Honey, if you think that fool's in love with you, then you're a bigger fool than you are. Then you're a bigger fool than he is. Love is not abusive. Love does not inspire abuse. Love is the opposite of that. Love inspires you to do those things which make the other person happy. It's sad that so many Christians in the world today live their Christian life as though they are in a relationship with an abusive husband. Our God is anything today but an abusive husband. Husband, 1 John 5, 1 through 3 declares, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. See, when you love the children of God, you're keeping God's commandments. You're doing what the Lord would ask you to do. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Simply meaning we do as He asks us to do. And His commandments are not grievous. I started sharing a little while ago and I got off track. I talked about my great-grandmother and I got so busy talking about her I forgot what I wanted to say about that. But it fits in right here. When my great-grandmother died, I made a vow. See, I was the kind of person, especially a young person, that I'd leave the house and my bed would be all messed up, you know, and I didn't bother making it. I said, why well, make it? I'm going to come home after a while and I'm going to crawl into it and and tonight I'm going to get in bed and, you know, I'm going to mess it up all over again. So I just didn't see the need to make my bed. But, you know, my great-grandma, bless her heart, she believed in a couple of things. Every morning she'd get up and first thing she'd do is make her bed. And second thing she'd do is get dressed. You never saw my grandma ever running around in, in uh, you know, a nightgown or, you know, whatever a robe, you know, that wasn't how she could, I know, when she woke up in the morning, the first thing she did was make her bed, and then she would get dressed, put on her dress, my great grandma, I never saw her in a pair of pants, she wore dresses, might be a house dress, you know, a simple dress, not fancy or anything but she always dressed well, when grandma died, I had been through experiences in the past with people who passed away and it always hurt me that after a period of time it seemed like any remembrance of them kind of just faded out you know after a while you, you almost forget they ever lived and every once in a while maybe a, 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 somebody mentioned their name or something and you kind of think about them for a minute and I said Lord I'm going to make a vow Every day before I leave my house, I'm not going to leave my house with my bed being a mess. From now on, I'm going to make my bed like Grandma did. I'm going to make it up. I, I may not make it as fancy and as pretty as she did, but I'm going to pull it together so that when I come home at night and I look at that bed, it looks nice and tidy and put together. And I'm doing that in memory of my great grandma because I love her so much that I don't want one single day to go by that I have not thought of her. And do you know every single day, folks, when I make that bed, I'll say, Grandma, I'm doing this in memory of you because I don't never want to forget my grandma. Now, I'm going to tell you, there are times that Tommy and I are getting ready to go somewhere and we're about to do something and I'll say to him, Booby, can you do me a favor? 
can you pull that side of your bed together and make the bed? Or sometimes even if I'm having to do something else, I'll say, would you mind pulling the bed together and making the bed uh, so we can... And he'll look at me like, well, for crying out loud. Because you know what? It's not as important to him as it is to me. But it's so important to me. It's so important to me. And you know what? He'll do it. Does he do it? Because... He thinks it's as important to do as I do? No. Does he do it in honor of my grandmother's memory? No. But he understands how important it is to me. And when you love somebody, you do things that you wouldn't necessarily do if it weren't for them asking you to do it. Do you follow what I'm saying? The same thing is true of those who claim to love God. How in the world can you love the Lord and not do the things He asks you to do? If you love God the way you ought to love God, then the little things He asks you to do, you're, you're, you do them without complaint. You do them without murmuring. Amen. Why? Because it may not, you may not even understand the logic or the reasoning behind God's asking us to do certain things. But you know this, it makes Him happy and He appreciates it. So you do it out of love. The more you love someone, the more readily and enthusiastically you will do those things which they ask of you. Not only will you gladly do those things which they ask of you, but you'll also find yourself doing things which they have not asked of you, but you know they enjoy, appreciate, and that those actions please them. Yes, uh, yesterday I came home from Oklahoma. I was up there about three days nearly. Uh, working on our little hunting cabin up there. I'm trying to finish the inside. Any of you that have watched my pictures on Facebook over the last while know that uh, I bought the cabin as an empty shell. So all you had was two by four wrapped up in siding and a roof. That's it. It was an empty shell. And so I told Tommy, I said, I'm going to finish that cabin out by myself. I want the insulation factor to be much higher. Uh, I spent a couple of winter nights up there, uh, and boy, I mean to tell you, it got down to like 20 degrees. And man, that cabin was cold, because all you had between you and the cold was siding about yay thick. And so I said, you know, I want to put up some wood, and then I'm going to put some... Uh, paneling up over that to make it look real pretty. I'm going to trim everything real nice. It's going to look real nice. Well, Tommy can't see stuff until it's done. I can describe it to him until I'm blue in the face, but he'll just look at me with his look like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't get it. He's not able to envision things ahead of time. So, I want to get up there and I want to get that cabin finished out. Now, you know what's funny? Tommy never asked me for a minute to do that. And yet, the majority of my motivation for doing it is Tommy. Because I know that by finishing out and making it look pretty and making it feel more homey and making it more comfortable, it's going to make it that much easier for him to go up there and enjoy that. See, when I was a kid, we used to go camping. Man, I've slept in tents and cold nights. I've slept in tents on hot days. You know, I've had spiders crawling around my feet while I'm trying to sleep and wake up and see a monster sitting there. And You know, uh, I can't say that some of these things thrill me, but I've done that when I was a kid, and I love camping. I love so-called roughing it. But Tommy doesn't have that same experience. I put in an air conditioner in our cabin. We've got a, a generator that works on propane or gasoline, either one. And, oh, I was just so happy because I knew that would make my booby happy. See, sometimes when you love somebody, you do stuff for them even that they have not asked you to do. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? And you do it because you love them. There are many things that we do for the Lord when we love the Lord that He hasn't even asked us to do. But we know that that action will make Him happy. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. 
Jesus has risen from the dead. He's beginning to manifest himself and appear to his disciples. And the word of God declares, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night caught they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? Meaning, ye caught anything? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Well, I'm going to tell you, sometimes our blessing is so close, but we've got our net on the wrong side of the boat. That's why it's so important to do what the Lord asks us to do. Am I telling the truth? Therefore, that disciple, oh, excuse me, uh, they answered no. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Their net was so full, they literally could not even lift it up out of the water. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, who is the author of this passage, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. See, John recognized, Hey, you know what? That's Jesus. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now, naked doesn't necessarily mean completely without clothes, but it does mean that, you know, with the barest minimum clothing. And did cast himself into the sea. Peter heard, oh, John said, hey, you know what, that's Jesus. And immediately Peter thought, well, you know what, that makes perfect sense, because when somebody tells you to cast it in on the other side of the boat, you don't expect to find anything on the other side, because one side ought to be as dry as the other side. But when we all of a sudden got so many fish, we can't, you know what, two and two, and two equals four, and this makes sense. And he literally was so excited, he... He pulled something over himself real quick and jumped into the water. He couldn't even wait for them to row the ship back to shore. He couldn't even wait till they got that boat back to shore. No, he was so excited to see the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you, there's love. Amen. There's love. Oh, isn't that something when you got somebody that loves you so much that they go on a trip and they come home and you're just so excited to see them and they're so excited to see you. Maybe they're getting off an airplane and I'm telling you, they're so impatient having to wait in line to get off that plane and it, it's driving them crazy. Now, it's only going to be a minute or two more, but you know what? When you really care about some of that minute or two seems like an eternity, doesn't it? And boy, I mean, they finally get, off, get out of the airplane and I mean, they bullet up that ramp and they push past everybody else and they fly... Why? Because they're that anxious to see you. Doesn't that make you feel special? Doesn't that make you feel loved? Of course, Tommy decides, I ain't going to miss it all that. I'll just let everybody else get off first, and I'll go last. Charles will be there when I get there. <laughs> the Word of God tells us that we know we love God when we love His people. You cannot love whom you have not seen, and not love your brethren, whom you have seen, our primary text tells us. When we love the Lord, we love all those who also love Him. The Scriptures declare that when we love God as we are, we will love one another 
and the commandments of God are not grievous. Doing those things which please the Lord become so much easier and we are able to do them without complaint or question when we have grown in the knowledge of Him which in turn causes our love for Him to grow and flourish. Lastly today, 2 Timothy 1, 7 for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 John 4, verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Love and fear do not occupy the same room, folks. Our relationship with Him is what it ought to be, then we ought to act the way we act, not because we fear hell, but because we look forward to heaven. We have no fear that will not make heaven. We have no thoughts that we might miss the mark and somehow or another fail to make the rapture. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Sadly today, the lack of love for God and a passion for the Lord that seems to exist in the lives of so many believers, I believe is fully the fault of preachers and spiritual leaders who preach a message based upon fear rather than than flourishing in love. When we preach, teach, and encourage people to know the Lord better, they cannot help but find themselves loving Him more, and perfect love casteth out fear. Fear and love cannot coexist. Why do you act like that? Well, Pastor, why do you act like why, why don't you drink and go to the bars and go to the nightclubs and do what so many other people do? Well, I'll tell you why, because I'm in love with Jesus. I don't drink because I do not need alcohol to have a good time. I do not drink because I do not need a substance to help me deal with my troubles or my trials. I have Jesus. I do not drink because as a member of the body of Christ, there are many people in our body who have addictive personalities and who are uh, physically prone to becoming addicted to alcoholic substance. And I do not drink to protect them because by my not drinking, I am encouraging them to also stay away from these substances. You know, I had an uncle, and I'm trying to close right now, I had an uncle who was a terrible alcoholic for many, many years. He would try to quit drinking every once in a while, and his wife would hang around with their friends, and their friends would be out there drinking, you know, and and he'd say, no, no, I don't want anything. And he'd try so hard. And his wife would look at him and say, oh, come on, Eddie. Oh, come on, Eddie. You can have one drink. You just don't need to keep drinking until you're drunk. Well, no. Once he had one, he was over the edge and he'd keep drinking. He didn't know how to stop. She would encourage him that way. Well, as a child of God, there are many things that I do that I do not because I cannot control the number of drinks that I have, or not because I can't avoid drunkenness, but because there are other believers around me who would have trouble with that. And therefore I do these things as a member of the body to be a strong and healthy cell that's encouraging the next cell to be strong and healthy. You understand what I'm saying today? I live the way I live, I act the way I act because I'm in love. I'm in love with Jesus. I don't fear God. I love God.
and that today is why I act the way I act. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?